Hi, I'm Uncle Todd. I'm in sunny Southern California. I don't know where you are, but I do know you're about to learn something about Amplitube. Let's get started. I will mostly be talking about the Amplitube standalone application, and that's what you're looking at here. You may not realize it, but you also installed a plug-in version of Amplitube that can be used in tools like a digital audio workstation or GarageBand, but we'll likely look at those in a, in a future video. Right now, I want to stick with the main standalone application. IK calls their interface simple, and they have put a lot of very thoughtful design into the interface. However, it does a lot, and I don't really find it simple, especially when I was starting out. Let me start by breaking it down to the major functional areas. This will give us a common vocabulary when talking about it. We can start with the top bar, which allows us to select and save presets, navigate to the various modes of the standalone app, and in the plugin version, you will notice that these buttons are missing. The next section is for ToneNet, and I'm not going to explore that except to point out that if you click on it, you might run into a bug. Let me see if I can replicate it. Okay, uh, I'm not sure the exact steps, but sometimes what happens is you get into ToneNet, it asks you for the account, you say no, and the ToneNet area uh, dims. It doesn't, it doesn't look like it's active anymore. And you can be easily confused about where you are, but it turns out it's still clickable. Just click it one more time and you'll return. The next section is the gear view, and it's very interactive, sometimes in pleasantly surprising ways. Generally, clicking and click-dragging lets you modify whatever piece of gear you are displaying. At the bottom of the gear view is an additional way to both turn on and off the piece of gear you're looking at or to switch to another piece of gear. I don't switch gear here very often because just to the right is the gear selection area or the gear browser. This lets you search and select gear as well. We'll come back into this section probably multiple times. But for now, I want to point out one feature that eluded me and would have saved me some frustration. This little amp icon to the right is clickable and it's quite useful. The check mark and X icon indicates that the gear shown below is all the gear available to the application, whether I own it or not. With Amplitude Max, I now own most of it, so it wasn't such a big problem. But when I was in Custom Shop, I remember having to scroll past lots of gear I didn't own and it was annoying. Click this symbol again, and it changes to the icon to just the check mark. The view below is limited to just the gear you own. Click it again, and you have just the gear you don't own. Ah, nice. So back to our main tour. Beneath the gear view is the chain view. This is worth looking at in a bit more depth. Let's start in the middle, and we'll come back to the leftmost icons in a minute. After the image of the guitar cable is the tuner, a good place to start when you boot Amplitube. Click and the tuner appears. If the power button is off, click it and it's on. Note at the bottom, we are in the easy mode, which is all I want to cover. The mute button can be useful live so that you can tune visually without making the audience listen to you. It works like most other tuners I have used and it's just more visible and you can tell which octave you are in and how many cents you are out of tune. I'll click on the amp in the chain view to take us back to the gear view we had. The next button is the direct input path for your guitar. Clicking it shows the path in color. You can add effects into this path and even before this path, which means I better talk about effects for a minute since we aren't seeing any at the moment. In the gear browser, I'll click on the stomp box icon, search for distortion, then I can drag the pedal over to the chain view. Notice that the first place I can drop it is after the start of the direct path. There is what I think is a non-obvious feature here. If you right-click the DI button and change to DI Post, then your effects move to before the DI and you can only drag the pedals to that area now. I'll set it back to Pre. The next button is a routing or path button. It allows you to split your mono input signal into two or three parts or to split a stereo input into parallel paths. Clicking the button here cycles through the various options on the left or you can directly click on those icons to jump to the setting you want. One important thing to note is that after the routing button, you have another effects area. I can drag the pedal to here. You can also control the setting for the pedal in the gear view. Clicking the foot pad area allows you to turn the effect on and off and you can click and drag the various knobs. I can also add multiple pedals to either area. I'll just grab another distortion pedal. 
The power button in the upper left allows you to bypass all the pedals in this area with a single click. You can drag pedals from one area to another. Right clicking exposes a menu that allows you to bypass or remove the pedal. Let me clear my search. You can put effects after the amplifier and after the mixer. You can use rack effects or pedal effects in either area. If you put a rack effect in a stomp area or a stomp effect in a rack area, the interface is a little bit more cumbersome and you can use the edit button to get to the controls. I almost forgot, you can also put the effects after the cabinet. You can only put two effects here. Notice that when an area will accept an effect, the routing line itself turns white. When it won't, only the existing effects turn white and dragging a device will replace one of the existing effects. Different areas support different numbers of effects. The pre-routing supports six effects. You can put six more after the routing for each route. The post amplifier area supports four. The post cabinet area supports two and the mixer supports six. Whew, that's a lot of nine volt batteries you just saved. And next we have the amp section. I refer to the AmpliTube as an amplifier modeling software, but you can tell it's a lot more just by how long it took us to get here. Certain elements of this view can be clicked, like the power and sensitivity buttons. Others are manipulated by click and drag operations, but you can also type in the values you want, and that works for pedals as well. At the bottom, it shows the name of your amp and has various controls for selecting other amps. And the power button is another way to turn off the amp. The up and down arrows just move you through the amps in sequence. I find it more useful to use the gear browser and just search and drag an amp over the existing amp. If this is all overwhelming, just search for champ and drag over the 57 champ amp and enjoy a moment of zen where you have nothing but a power button and a volume knob to distract you. Do notice that when you changed amps, it brought over a paired cabinet with it. Let's get back to the default. If you remember, it was called Brit 8000, so we can search for Brit and the proper amp and drag it back. Next is another splitter, and we can click on it to split our signal to more than one cabinet. Let's say we love the sound of the 57 Champ cabinet. Click on the cabinets icon in the gear browser and drag over the 57 Champ. The icons on the far left do not affect this splitter. In fact, if you toggle to a split chain now, it will keep your cabinet selections as they are. Let's go back to one chain and one cabinet because there is enough to explore with just this. Again, in the gear view, we get a lot of details. In fact, there is too much in this view for this video. I'll come back to examine this in detail in a future video. Finally is the mixer button, which mixes the various mics and effects, and again is beyond the pale for this video. Whew, that was a lot, but before we wrap up, let me mention that there is also a bottom bar. Again, there's enough here for a video, but if you're just starting, note the input and output meters. If you're having trouble getting things to work, these are super helpful for troubleshooting. If you have problems, the first thing to note is if amplitude is getting input, and if it is, is it generating output? This was not a comprehensive review of everything Amplitude can do, not even close, but I hope if you're just starting, it makes you more comfortable. One parting tip, when you've made changes to your current setup, the name in the top bar will have an asterisk as a suffix. If you want to get back to your original value, use the drop down to reselect the same option. If you want to save your changes, then please click subscribe and like, and we'll see you in the next video.